Shalom. In a previous lesson, we discussed the relationship of the word kav, which means line, and the line which is in the sky, which connects the two fish of the constellation Pisces. In this set of lessons, we're going to look at each of the constellations and how they relate to the Hebrew calendar. There are uh, at least three synagogues, ancient synagogues, in uh, the Galilee area where the zodiac appears as a mosaic on the floor of the synagogue. These synagogues are from, I think, maybe the third to fifth century BC. This particular one is the Beit Alpha synagogue, and it's uh, in the middle of the Beit Alpha kibbutz. You can go and visit it as a tourist site. I think this is the one that is in the best condition of the three that I'm familiar with. It's not the uh, finest artwork, but you can clearly see that the signs, the constellations of the zodiac are represented and uh, named in this mosaic. When I did go to visit, they had a movie there explaining about how the floor of the synagogue came to be. And so they have these actors dressed up in the time period costumes and they two men go off to uh, find the latest kind of artwork that's happening in synagogues in the area. And they come back with this picture and they show it to the rabbi. And the rabbi says, well, this is a very, I can't remember if it was Greek or pagan kind of thing for us to put on our synagogue. And the two men who have the plan say, no, no, this is the latest thing that's happening in synagogues everywhere. And um, besides, uh, above it, we're going to put a mosaic of the Ten Commandments. And below it, we'll put a mosaic of the Akedah, the binding of Isaac. And so the rabbi agrees that it's okay for them to build this particular uh, mosaic in the floor of the synagogue. Now there have been a lot of teachings about how the series of the constellations reflects the gospel. Probably the most famous of these is by E.W. Bullinger. It's called The Witness of the Stars. You can read this book online at philologos.org. Uh, this book was published in the 1890s, I believe. There have been many other studies as well, uh, even before and since that time, but this is the best known of them. Our purpose here, however, is to connect the each constellation with the Hebrew month in which it appears. And as you can see in this particular picture, we see the name of the constellation. This is Sagittarius. It's called Keshet. Uh, which means bow, the bow and arrow, bow. And uh, we can see the month also designed into the picture. It's the months of Kislev. And so there is uh, a lot of correspondence between the picture, which is in the sky for that month, and the events of each month. We're going to start with the month of Elul. Uh, this is the month of Elul right now, and that is part of the reason that we're going to start here. But we'll see another pattern come up later. Now the names of the months are not uh, always mentioned in the, in the Bible. The names of the months came out of Babylon with the people. They should be just first, second, third, and fourth month, and so on. But here in Nehemiah 6.15, we see that this month is mentioned by name. So the wall was finished in the twenty and fifth day of the month of Elul in fifty and two days. Elul is traditionally the month of repentance in the Jewish calendar. You can see a pattern of forty days of repentance running from the first of Elul until Yom HaKippurim, the Day of Atonement, the tenth day of the following month. Uh, kind of resembles another period of 40 days. Maybe uh, you know some people celebrate on the other side of the year. The number 52 I believe is significant and we will tie this together shortly because it is the gematria for the word Ben. 
A ben is a son. It comes from the root bana, which means to build, to build a house. So I think the 52 days of them finishing the wall, uh, the building, and the coming of the sun, S-O-N, are all connected. So Elul is the sixth month, and we're going to see a few other things that happened in the sixth month that are documented in Tanakh. Ezekiel 8, 1 through 3. And it came to pass in the sixth year, in the sixth month, on the fifth day of the month, as I sat in mine house, and the elders of Judah sat before me, that the hand of the Lord God fell there upon me. Then I beheld, and lo, a likeness as the appearance of fire, from the appearance of his loins even downward, fire, and from his loins even upward, as the appearance of brightness, as the color of amber. And he put forth the form of a hand, and he took me by a lock of my head, and the Spirit lifted me up between the earth and the heaven, and brought me in the visions of God to Jerusalem, to the door of the inner gate that looks toward the north, where was the seat of the image of jealousy, which provoketh to jealousy. And the chapter goes on as Ezekiel has this vision. Uh, he's not in Jerusalem, but God shows him what's happening there. And there is great abomination happening in the temple. He shows him the defilement of the temple. He shows him actually the, the priests are facing the sun and worshiping the sun. So all this pagan practice, idolatry, defilement is what Ezekiel sees. So as we come to a time of repentance, first we have to see what we need to repent from. What are the problems? What are the active sins, the, the repetitive sins in our life, so that we can repent and turn away from those things? The sixth month is also mentioned in Haggai, chapter 1, verses 1 through 5. In the second year of Darius the king, in the sixth month, in the first day of the month came the word of Yahweh by Haggai, the prophet, unto Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, the governor of Judah, and to Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, saying, Thus speaketh Yahweh of hosts, saying, This people say, The time is not come, the time that Yahweh's house should be built. Then came the word of Yahweh by Haggai, the prophet, saying, is it time for you, O ye, to dwell in your sealed houses, and this house lie in waste? Now therefore, thus saith Yahweh of hosts, consider your ways. And this uh, sentence is repeated, consider your ways. It's time to change your ways. Think about what you have done. What's happened here in Haggai is that the people came back to the land. It was uh, maybe four or five years short of the 70 year exile. And so the people were not building the house of the Lord, they were building their own houses. And God comes and he chides them and he says, you need to think about this. You need to build my house. Okay, so again, connected to Nehemiah, the idea of building the house, to build a house properly, a clean house, and for us to consider our ways, to think about what is our house and how can we uh, consider our ways, repent for our sin? Now the rabbis tie the month of Elul to Amos 3.8. They have an acronym about the lion. The lion hath roared, who will not fear? The Lord Yahweh hath spoken, who can but prophesy? And so one thing that we do during the month of Elul is that the shofar is blown every day. The blowing of the shofar is related here to the roaring of the lion. A shofar is blown for these different reasons at the time of the crowning of the king, the time for repentance, what we're talking about now. Of course, it was blown at Sinai when Torah was given. It is the call of the watchman. It is a sound for battle. It's connected to the binding of Isaac in that the ram took the place of Isaac on the altar and so the rabbis uh, say that Abraham took one horn and God took the other or maybe one horn was blown at Sinai and God is saving the other horn for the future event. 
We also see that the blowing of the shofar uh, arouses fear. It is blown, of course, on the Day of Judgment. We're looking, the whole month of Elul, we're looking forward to what's coming in the seventh month, the time of repentance, and uh, even in up until Sukkot. Uh, the final ingathering, which is the time of Sukkot, will also be accompanied by shofar and the resurrection of the dead. So we blow the shofar every day during Elul, that we would be alert, that we'd be ready for battle, that we are preparing our hearts for what's coming in the following month. Another interesting thing that happened in the sixth month is documented in Luke 1. And in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God unto the city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin espoused to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. So we have the um, announcement to Mary of her being the chosen vessel to carry the Messiah into the world and this happens in the sixth month and so as it just happens to turn out the constellation for this month the month of Elul the sixth month is Virgo the Virgin you can see very typically drawn uh, with wings in her left hand she is holding this little small sheaf of wheat and in her right hand she is holding a palm frond so this is the other part of the reason that we're starting in Elul. Uh, Bullinger also started his story with Virgin. Uh, I think in most people's minds, it's where the story of the gospel starts with the virgin birth. Part of what Bullinger describes is the mystery of the Sphinx. The Sphinx is uh, the front of a woman and the back of some kind of cat or lion. If we start our story here with Virgo, then we will end with Leo the lion, and I'm sure you can see how that would be significant. The name for the constellation Virgo in Hebrew is Betula, and we don't have to guess at this. It's in the mosaics. That's how it's printed there. And the first use of this word is in Genesis 24:16. And the damsel was very fair to look at, a virgin, neither had any man known her. And she went down to the well and filled her pitcher and came up. So this is the story of the servant. Very interesting story with respect to the idea of the virgin that uh, the, the servant is going to find a bride for Isaac. Isaac, as we know, is a, a type of Messiah. We see that he is the beloved son of Abraham, that Abraham is uh, asked to offer up as a complete burnt offering in the last minute. The whole deed is averted by an angel. But the man who is going off to find the bride for this uh, Messiah type is unnamed even though we know that it's Eliezer but in this chapter it is uh, he is unnamed and he goes off and finds a woman according to his uh, specifications and requirements and she is willing to go she is going to meet a man she has never seen although she has heard a great deal about it and she will be his bride one of the ways that the rabbis tie uh, Virgo to repentance is through this verse in Jeremiah 31.21. In your Tanakh, it'll be 31.20. Set thee up waymarks and make thee high heaps. Set thine heart toward the highway, even the way which thou wentest. Turn again, O virgin of Israel, turn again to these thy cities that the virgin Israel would repent. So they tie this repentance and the virgin, to get, virgin together through this verse in Jeremiah. Now the palm frond in the right hand uh, kind of looks forward a bit to Sukkot. We can see that. The uh, brightest star in, in the constellation Virgo is in that sheaf of wheat and it's called 
uh, spica or spica, I don't really uh, know how to pronounce Latin, but it means an ear of grain, um, a piece of wheat. So that's interesting concerning the role of the virgin and, uh, and his mother, Miriam, Mary. In Arabic, this star is called Azimach, which is the definite article in Arabic al, which means the, and semach, which means branch, in, uh, also in Hebrew. So where do we see this tzemach? Isaiah 4.2 In that day the branch of Yahweh shall be beautiful and glorious, and the fruit of the earth shall be excellent and comely for them that are escaped of Israel. If you have escaped, that means you have lived through uh, tribulation, and uh, you are in the millennial kingdom. Zechariah 3.8 Hear now, O Joshua the high priest, thou and thy fellows that sit before thee, for they are men wondered at. For behold, I will bring forth my servant, the branch, Tzemach, a messianic prophecy. Zechariah 6.12 And speak unto him, saying, Thus speaketh Yahweh of hosts, saying, Behold the man whose name is the branch, and he shall grow out of his place, and he shall build the temple of Yahweh. Again, back to the idea of building the temple. The temple, remember, is a place of uh, repentance where you can come and make offerings to repent for your sin. In fact, it, by Leviticus, these things are required. On the other hand, when Yeshua was speaking, he said, uh, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. Then said the Jews, Forty and six years was this temple in building, and thou wilt rear it up in three days. But he spake of the temple of his body. So the complete fulfillment for our repentance is in the building. Remember we talked about the sun and the building. The building that the sun is himself, his body, which is, uh, he was referring to as the temple. He is the true place of our complete repentance when we believe on him. Another connection that the rabbis make between um, Elul and the uh, beloved uh, bride who is the virgin is from this a passage in Song of Songs which says, Ani dodi vidodi li, and I'm sure you're familiar with that phrase. And you can see the first letters of that phrase, Aleph, Lamed, Vav, Lamed, spell out the name of the month, Elul. As we think about the beloved virgin bride, this might come to mind, Revelation 12, 1 through 4. And there appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, and the moon under her feet, and upon her head a crown of twelve stars. And she being with child cried, travailing in birth, and pain to be delivered. And there appeared another wonder in heaven, and behold a great dragon having seven heads and ten horns, and seven crowns upon his heads. And his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven, and did cast them to earth. And the dragon stood before the woman which was ready to be delivered, for to devour her child as soon as it was born. And we know that the child is taken up to heaven and that the woman is protected in the wilderness for a certain amount of time. There are uh, people who have done astronomical research who believe that this sign actually appeared in Virgo in the heavens at the time of Yeshua's birth, that uh, there was the crown of stars on her head and also the moon at her feet and uh, of course there is a the sun because this is actually a sun sign virgo um, which would mean that perhaps yeshua was born um, maybe right at the end of the month of elul going into the uh, time of the seventh month of tishrei There is another set of imagery of virgins that should come to mind. Matthew 25, 1. Then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins, which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. 
It's interesting that all the virgins are asleep. When the call comes, we can imagine that it is the sound of the shofar. And we've already talked about all the meanings of the shofar blast. They all wake up, but only half of them are prepared. There's a lot of teaching I'm sure you've already had on what the meaning of the oil is. But at the end of the parable, it talks about the fact that no man knows the day or the hour. Now remember, we're in the period of repentance and we're coming up to Yom Truah, the day of blowing, the blowing of the trumpets. And surely the imagery that is attached to the seventh month is very reminiscent of the return of Yeshua. Now, if we know the season, then why is it that we cannot know the day or the hour? The day or the hour must be re- determined exactly by the sighting of the moon by two witnesses. So I think we can be clear. It doesn't say that we don't know the season. I think we know the season. We just don't know the exact day or hour because we must wait for the sighting of the moon this of the seventh month for the two witnesses. I pray that you are prepared in every event while you are waiting and you have much to think about. Remember, keep your eyes on the sky, your redemption draweth nigh. Shalom.